Coming up on this episode of Photography Online, we take advantage of the early evenings by painting with light, we test three 100-400mm lenses to see which one is best, and we tell you all you need to know if you want to fly a drone in 2021. Welcome to part two of our January episode of Photography Online, which is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. If you don't know, VPNs allow you to connect to the internet via an encrypted tunnel, which maintains your online privacy and protects your sensitive data. We'll be telling you more about that soon, but first, it's time for essential camera skills, where we show you various photography techniques. With it being in the depths of winter, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, there's not much natural light to play with, but who needs natural light when you can create your own wrap up warm, grab a torch, and you're painting with light. Welcome to the middle of a field on the Isle of Skye. And here we have a perfect subject to paint with light. Now, before we go any further, I thought we'd give it a name. You might remember last year we had Derek Mendoza. So I'm thinking Duncan the Digger, what do you reckon? If you want to try painting with light, it's important to be able to get reasonably close to your subject without being in the frame yourself, as if you're too far from it, the power of the torch will be insufficient. More on that in a moment. Now, this isn't the first time I've been here. I came here before just to scout out the location and I've worked out exactly where the camera needs to be. And I'm not going to go over that again because we've done that on many occasions with other videos. Um, we're just going to get straight on with the painting with light. But I've set my camera up in the perfect position I wanted to get quite close to the digger to really emphasize the bucket on the front because if you remember with Derek it had a kind of face and a character but this one as you can see it's kind of lacking anything like that so I thought the digger the the bucket at the front looks quite like a hand so I really want to emphasize that so what I've done is I've gone quite close so it's quite big in the frame and then because I'm so close having to use quite a wide angle lens but 12 millimeters on a full frame camera in order to get the top of the digger in the top of the frame. The camera's pointing quite up into the sky, which is giving us quite an interesting perspective. And then ideally, we want a bit of texture in the sky, which may or may not happen. So at the moment, we're just letting the light levels drop enough so that we can get the torches out and start lighting up Duncan. You want to arrive at your location well before dark, as this will give you the opportunity to set everything up and focus accurately. We're basically waiting for the perfect time when the ambient light is low enough for the torchlight to be dominant, but not so low that we lose all shadow detail. The window of opportunity will last anywhere from 2 to 20 minutes, depending on where you are in the world. Basically, the closer to the equator, the shorter the window. So having given it some thought, we're going to need three different angles of light here. We're going to need one from the back, and that's going to be crucial because without that light, we're not going to see anything under the middle of the digger there. So we need one light from the back, and then obviously we're going to need one from this side because that's going to light this side of the digger. But then we're going to have the underside of the bucket there very dark. So we're going to need another one from this side as well. Now, obviously, that would be a big job for me to run around and light it from three different angles and get it all in one shot. So I've recruited a team of helpers to be my torch bearers. And then just to cap it off, just to make it a little bit fun, uh, what I've done is when I came before, I noticed that the bucket here was full of water um, and I thought, how can we use that to our advantage? So I've ordered a big block of dry ice, which when the time comes, I'm going to dump that in and hopefully may or may not work because the water in there is going to be very cold. Um, but hopefully we'll get lots of dry ice kind of coming out, pouring out of the bucket just to give it a little bit of a sort of sci-fi feel. Because as you'll agree, this is quite a science fiction-y subject here. So it's almost dark enough now, probably another 15, 20 minutes. So um, you can see that the torches are having, starting to have an effect there. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start doing uh, some exposures and we'll just get everything rehearsed so that everybody knows what they're doing. So that when that magic time comes where the ambient light is perfect, then we're not kind of experimenting and getting it wrong and learning lessons when we need to be taking the photos. Three, two, one, go. When you paint with light, you need to use a long enough exposure time to record all the illumination of the torch movement. Here, I'm exposing for 10 seconds, so everything lit by the torches during this time will be exposed, but only for the duration they are lit for. For example, 
If different parts of the digger need two seconds of torch exposure, then five different areas can be lit within the 10 second exposure. Uh, Nick, even less on the ground, because there's water underneath, so it's kind of like flaring a bit. Do the same as what you're doing, but put the torch on a lower power. Uh, Ruth, you just do the same. This is 15 seconds now. So three, two, one, go. One of the most useful rules to understand in photography is the inverse square law. If you understand this, then it makes many areas of photography much easier to control. In this case, I'm using the inverse square law to control the power of each individual torch, simply by adjusting the distance between the light source and the subject. Uh, so Ruth, you can spend more time on the bucket and this front bit of the arm and less on the, on the body. Nick, you're the same. Okay, three, two, one, go. Put simply, the inverse square law states that if you double the distance between the light source and the subject, you reduce the intensity of light to a quarter of what it was, as the same beam of light is now covering an area twice the width and twice the height, meaning that the original area is only receiving 25% of the total illumination. Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, so Ruth, just come a tiny bit closer, a few steps closer, and just try and get a little bit more of the grass down here. Not too much, just suck. I know I told you to try and stay off of it, but it's just dying a little bit now in the corner. Right, three, two, one, go. The definition of the inverse square law is that the intensity of light is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the light source and the subject. Now that might sound a little complicated, but this scale should already be familiar to you as you already have it on your camera. Look at your aperture settings and you'll see what I mean. Let's say you're at 11 meters from your subject and you want to increase the power of your torch by one stop. Simply reduce your distance to eight meters and the torch will now be double the intensity it was at 11 meters, exactly the same as going from F11 to F8 on your aperture scale. Similarly, changing the distance from eight meters to 16 meters will reduce the power by two stops. It's that easy, but so useful when it comes to controlling exposure with artificial light. Right, do exactly that again then, and we'll get the dry ice this time. Okay, right, three, two, one, go. <laughs> if you want to use dry ice in your photography, then please note that it should be handled with extreme care, as it has a temperature of around minus 78 degrees Celsius or minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit. If it comes into contact with skin, there's the potential for a serious burn. It is, however, lots of fun and can add that wow factor to any scene. Yeah, it's nice. Hang on, let's have a quick look. Okay, we got it. As we packed up, Ruth seemed particularly fascinated by the bubbling cauldron, so I got the hell out of there before she started casting her evil spells. <laughs>so I have to admit that was great fun and what a dramatic image we ended up with now the shot that you saw at the end there was an edited version this was the raw file which came out of the camera and although it's not bad like most raw files it does need some life injected into it we thought it would be interesting to give the photo to one of the other team members to edit as this way they're looking at the image unobjectively without being influenced by anything which happened during the shoot so in a moment we'll be joining James McCormick as he talks us through the post processing that he applied to the shot but before that here's Harry to tell us why you might be interested in Surfshark VPN. In the modern digital world where so much of our information exists online it's important to keep that secure and safe that's where VPNs come in they encrypt our data to keep us safe whether we're using public Wi-Fi we're at home or as I hope to be doing again soon traveling abroad. Another great feature of Surfshark VPN is that it will block those annoying pop-up ads that seem to be everywhere these days. Surfshark's clean web feature means I know I'm protected from malware, targeting, and even dodgy internet scams. 
Surfshark is also the only service that lets you connect an unlimited number of devices with just a single membership. That means you can keep your phone, your tablet, and your computer all safe and protected at the same time. Surfshark is dead simple to set up and the best value service out there. If you want to give it a go, you can use the code PHOTOGRAPHY to get 83% off and three months free. There's a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's really nothing to lose. Get yourself protected online now using the links in the description below. Thanks, Harry. I hope that will be useful to many of you. Okay, so without further ado, let's take the photo we just took and process it in the digital darkroom. Here he is, here is Duncan. Now, this image appears to have much to work with. So I'm going to draw out much of that potential as I possibly can using, in the main, one of my most favorite tools, the radial filter. Okay, so let's see what we can do. Now, the first thing to do is basic global adjustments, very roughly, all done with instinct with an image like this. It's not representative, it is a portrait. There's no right and wrong, so trust your instincts. Exposure and I'm going to give it a little bit of shadows to start with. Now the key thing here is what we're going to start to do is bring out his personality. Make your eyes focus on him. Create a natural vignette. So it's now angled in the same angle here. So shadows, whites, exposure. There. Same angle, but just slightly smaller this time. Similar, again, keep it nice and organic, keep it fluid, don't want to be too staged about it. And then the last one will be over him himself there. So let's bring out, there will be a little bit of exposure in him this time. And I don't mind if he has a bit of a glow behind him in this particular frame, because it's an artificially lit, it's fine. No drama. Now this time I'm going to bring out Duncan's undercarriage a little bit, because I think it's will help the image and it's probably shadows, whites and probably overall exposure there. There we go. Now, next thing, turn our attention to this bucket and the dry ice. So there's a little bit poking through there, let's exaggerate that. Now in theory we want this to be brighter and this to be a little less brighter and then going out of frame here nice and rough and ready again. So it's all done by eye, it's done by feel, nice and natural. Okay, so that's the next stage completed. Now there are a couple of things that stand out to me and one is this detail in here. Now it's okay, but it's a bit too bright and a bit too overcooked for me and it's distracting. So I'm just gonna darken that down a bit. And in fact, I'm gonna expand that across there, somewhere in that region there. And that requires taking out some saturation as well. So it's not too distracting. I'm gonna brighten his face there shadows and some whites and the last couple of details the window his broken window glass so just take that out whites and highlights and a little bit there whites and highlights now there's quite a lot of faffing about being going on to this image and you wouldn't normally spend this amount of time applying this number of radial filters to an image but in this particular instance it's a bit of fun why not have fun with it now we're back to the global adjustments and I think what I'm actually going to do is give it a global vignette like that and then go back to the overall globals and just tweak the whites and that will give it the required punch we need at the end. And there we have it. So let's have a quick look at the before. There he is and there he is afterwards. Nice and punchy and full of personality. So you've just seen the entire process of a photo from conception through to capture and then to completion. I hope you picked up some tips along the way. If you want more tips like that, then I can highly recommend this. It's our Essential Camera Skills book, which covers everything we featured throughout last year, as well as lots of bonus tips and tricks from the show's experts. It's 68 pages crammed full of information to help you take your photography to the next level. It comes in both hard copy and PDF and is available from the relevant link in the description down below. Hello.
Now, if you love what we do here on Photography Online, then why not consider becoming an official supporter? Simply hit the join button, which is down here somewhere, or go to the relevant link below to see an extra video where I explain all the options. And a big thanks to everybody that's already joined. We really appreciate your support and hopefully you can see this already having an effect. All right, well, now it is time for Kit Corner, where this month we're looking at 100 to 400 millimeter zooms. This focal length is useful in so many genres of photography, from wildlife to sports and from portraits to landscapes. It's no surprise then that this lens range is high on the wish list of many photographers. We got hold of three of the most popular versions and thought that we'd pit them head to head for a heavyweight lens off. Here's your ringmaster and referee, Harry Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Heavyweight Championship, a battle of seven rounds to determine who will be crowned undisputed king of the telephoto zoos. In the red corner, weighing in at 1,160 grams, we have the Sigma F5 to 6.3. In the blue corner, weighing in at 1,120 grams, we have the Tamron F4.5 to 6.3. Then in the other corner, we have the Canon F4.5 to 5.3. Weighing in at a whopping 1,640 grams. So the Tamron won that round? We can't avoid talking about money, so let's just get it out of the way. The Canon. This is my own personal lens. This is three times the price of both the Sigma and the Tamron, which cost about the same. Is the Canon worth the extra money? Well, that's what we're gonna find out, and I hope I haven't wasted my hard-earned dosh. So after two gruelling rounds, we have the Tamron leading, followed by the Sigma and the Canon bringing up the rear. So while the Canon might be the biggest and bulkiest of these three lenses, it's the one that comes with the most features out the box. First up, it comes with a tripod collar mount built in. This is invaluable, and the other two, while the Tamron has a, an optional one you can buy, um, there's no option at all for the Sigma, and these really are invaluable for a telephoto lens of this size. It also has a tension ring to control how tight the zoom is. It's also fully weather sealed. So overall, it just packs in a bit more than the other two options. When it comes to minimum focus distances, the Sigma is the worst at 160 centimeters. The Tamron slightly better at 150 centimeters, but the Canon focuses right down to 98 centimeters, which not only allows subjects to be bigger in frame, but also results in better background blur. The Canon is a clear winner in round three, and I'll give the second place to the Sigma, despite not having the option for a tripod collar, as it does offer more functions overall. The aperture range of our lenses is a crucial technical aspect as it affects several other elements of our lens, such as the focusing speed and accuracy, and I'm going to test that in just a second. The more light that we let into our lens, the easier it is to freeze action around us, and this is an important consideration if you're interested in sports and wildlife photography. All three lenses have variable maximum apertures, which means as you zoom the lens, the widest aperture changes. At 100mm, both the Canon and Tamron will let you select f4.5, whereas the Sigma will only allow f5. If you zoom all the way to 400mm, however, then the Sigma and Tamron will only let you use f6.3 as your widest aperture, while the Canon comes out on top with a faster f5.6. It might not seem like a big change, but that extra smidgen of light really helps in challenging situations. On to the image stabilisation round. Now, testing this rigorously and scientifically is frankly going to be a little bit difficult, but I do want to give it a go and try and push these lenses to their limits. 
Now the Canon has four stops of image stabilization, as does the Tamron. Now I couldn't find the exact number for the Sigma, but it's almost exactly the same price as the Tamron. So I'm gonna start off by assuming it's about four stops, but we'll soon find out when I test it. I'm gonna shoot handheld, obviously it wouldn't work if we were on a tripod, and I'm gonna start off shooting each lens at 200 mil. No particular reason for that, I just wanna keep it constant for all three lenses. Now if I use the reciprocal rule, the lowest possible shutter speed I could use without image stabilization would be about 200th of a second. There's lots of caveats in there if you're cold and shaking or you're generally shaky hands anyway, it's gonna be slightly different, but for the purposes of this test, that's gonna be absolutely fine. I'm then gonna reduce that shutter speed by stop each time until I no longer get an acceptably sharp image. As stated, the Canon and Tamron enable me to hand hold a sharp shot at 1 15th of a second, which is four stops below the 1 200th reciprocal value. The Sigma gave the same, so for this round, it's a three-way draw. One of the most important factors when looking at purchasing a new lens is, of course, image quality. And there are hundreds of reviews for every lens out there looking at optical details and fancy MTF charts, but the trouble is sometimes these don't give us an idea of what a lens is like to use in the real world. All I'm interested in is how a lens performs, the way I shoot and the way I take pictures. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot three images for each lens. One at 100mm, one at 200mm and one at 400mm. So then I've got the middle of the focal range and the two extremes. I'm also going to do this at the widest available aperture. Now I'm shooting all of these handheld because the Canon is the only one that comes with a tripod mount. So I want to make it as fair as possible and not stick this on a tripod and give it an unfair advantage. After examining the results 100% in Lightroom, there was an obvious difference between all three lenses, with the Canon being consistently sharper and with better contrast. The Tamron was noticeably less sharp than the Sigma at all focal lengths. If you want to photograph fast moving action, then having autofocus that is quick and accurate is an absolute necessity. This is going to be a fairly simple test, and I'm just going to try and photograph and track these flying seabirds along the coast to see which of the lenses performs best. With its slightly wider aperture range, it wasn't too much of a surprise that the Canon focused slightly quicker than the other two lenses. It wasn't far off, both the Sigma and the Tamron were pretty accurate, but they were noticeably slower as you tried to lock onto a moving subject. So, the winner is clearly the Canon. So, after battling it out to the death, which lens has come out on top? Well, unsurprisingly, because of the price, the Canon does win. It has more features, faster focusing, a wider aperture range, and far better image quality. So, there you have it, there's your winner. But, what if you want a more budget option and you can't spend the money on something like the Canon? Well, for me, it's gonna be the Sigma if I had to recommend one. It has slightly better image quality, more features overall, and I think represents better value. In a future show, we'll be looking at another popular zoom range, the 70 to 200 millimeter, to see how useful that can be for a whole range of photographic subjects. So I hope you're liking our new format show. Let us know in the comments what you think. And if you haven't seen part one of this month's show, then you'll have missed the subject project, where we looked at how to photograph lone trees and then invited you to give it a go. We photographed one of the most iconic birds in the world, the golden eagle. We gave you a tour of easily accessible locations on the Isle of Skye and we gave some of your images a darn good examination in the photography online surgery. That show as well as all of our others are available on our channel so take a look to make sure that you haven't missed any.
Now, 10 years ago, drones with cameras were a thing of science fiction, but nowadays they seem to be everywhere. Drone photography can be great fun and opens up a whole new way of seeing the world. Today, it is more affordable than ever, and with so many models on the market and in the air as well, this intense activity obviously needs to be managed. Here in the UK, the rules governing the use of drones has just been updated, so whether you're wanting to get into drone photography for the first time or whether you've already got a drone but are not sure about how the new regulations may affect you, here's Nick to tell you everything you need to know. One of the biggest revolutions in photography over the past 10 years has been in aerial photography. Long gone are the days when you had to hang out of the door of an aircraft risking dropping your gear and ruining your hair. <laughs> what? Drones have many advantages. You don't need to be at the height of a flying aircraft to take photos. It's much quicker and more convenient to shoot with a drone. It's much cheaper to shoot with a drone than to rent a plane. You can hover or fly slowly with a drone, making composition much easier. You have an unobstructed view in every direction and down below. With all these advantages and many others too, it's no surprise that drone photography has really taken off. See what I did there? Taken off? No? Oof, tough crowd. With the exponential growth in the number of drones in the sky, particularly around popular photo locations, it was only a matter of time before regulations had to be introduced to ensure that things didn't get out of control. These rules and regulations are ever-changing and vary from country to country, so it's understandable that they can often come across as confusing and complicated. Whether you already have a drone and want to know what the latest rules say, or whether you're thinking about getting a drone for the first time, I'm going to lay out the current rules as clearly as I can. Before I go any further, I want to make it clear that these are the rules in the UK. Other countries' rules may vary, so you'll need to look them up yourself, according to where you're planning to fly your drone. First of all, there are no-fly zones, places where you simply cannot fly your drone full stop. These are in or around the vicinity of airports or other areas where low-flying aircraft may operate, also over built-up, populated areas such as city centres and within many national park boundaries. The list is quite extensive, so just because we haven't mentioned it here doesn't mean it's not on the no-fly list. Do your research and only fly a drone once you know you're legally allowed to do so. In some respects, the new rules in the UK are more relaxed, but in other respects they are more stringent. There are basically two considerations, the drone itself and the operator. Let's look at the operator first. There are now three categories into which drone operation is possible. Open, specific and certified. The open category is the only one which doesn't require a specific licence or certification, so we'll assume that this is the one which is the most relevant to most casual drone shooters. This is where your drone poses no or low risk to third parties, a little confusingly, the open category is then subdivided into three more categories, A1, A2 and A3. Each of these has its own rules, so do your research as to what the individual restrictions are. The specific category is where your drone presents a greater risk with one or more elements not meeting the open category requirements. Flights in the specific category require the operator to have the required certification and operational authorization from the Civil Aviation Authority. The certified category is for drones over 25 kilograms, which basically come under the same rule as manned aircraft, so we'll assume that doesn't apply to photography online viewers. If you want to take your drone photography a little more seriously and be able to fly in a wider range of locations, there are two qualification tests that you can do. The first is the A2 Certificate of Competence, which reduces the distance you're required to keep from built-up areas. 
There is no practical test involved and this will allow you to fly in all open categories. The second is a General Visual Line of Sight Certificate, abbreviated to GVC, which allows you to fly in a specific category. This requires both a theory and practical assessment. Now let's look at how the drone itself influences where you can fly. Take off. One of the biggest changes in the recent revamp of rules is that all drones, regardless of weight, must now be registered if they include a camera. So if you have a DJI Mini which previously fell outside the rules, you now have to register it like you would with any other drone. This is an easy process and costs £9 per year. You also have to pass a basic online test to prove you're not a total moron, which validates you for three years, after which you will need to renew it to prove you haven't suddenly become a total moron. If a drone weighs more than 250 grams, then you mustn't fly it overhead a group of people at any height. You must keep your drone within visual line of sight at all times and not go above 120 metres unless you're flying over an obstacle and have permission to do so. You must display your operator ID on your drone. This acts like a licence plate for a car and can simply be written on some tape and then affixed to the inside of the battery compartment. You don't want to be marking the drone with permanent ink in case you want to sell it or it gets used by another operator. You don't want someone else operating under your ID. As of January the 1st 2023, all new drones will fall under a new category system of C0 to C4, depending on their weight, top speed and design. All pre-existing drones will then become known as legacy drones and, if over 250 grams, will be restricted accordingly. We tried to contact the CAA to clear up a couple of grey areas, but they failed to respond. As a result, please use this information as our best understanding rather than fact. The new rules for drone operators is already in place, but the new certification system for drones themselves doesn't seem to come into effect until the start of 2023. Finally, there is one guideline which trumps all others. It's called common sense. Regardless of what the rules are, wherever you are in the world, before flying a drone, consider if and how it will affect other people around you. If you're at a honeypot location where there are photographers with a camera set up on their tripods, the last thing they want is for a drone to fly into the scene just as the light reaches its optimum moment. If they were there first, apply common photographer's etiquette. In the same way that you wouldn't set up a tripod in front of another photographer, don't fly a drone in front of them. Maybe asking them politely if they would mind you flying your drone would be the best option, offering to get a shot of the scene with them in it as a kind gesture. If you're in a peaceful park with families enjoying their tranquility, maybe think about flying your drone somewhere else rather than ruin the atmosphere for those already there. If there's another drone already in the area, then wait for them to land before you take off. Consideration is free and doesn't involve much time, so exercising this, along with some basic common sense, will be sufficient in most cases. Most of the official rules and restrictions only exist because people haven't exercised consideration and common sense in the past. All the amazing drone footage you saw in that feature was filmed by certified operators who had permission to fly in those areas. In a future show, we'll be looking at the practical aspects of drone photography, sharing some of our tips and tricks on how to get the best results, so keep a lookout for that. That though brings us to the end of our January episodes, but you wouldn't have to wait too long before part one of our February edition, when, among other things, we'll be looking at how to shoot the Aurora Borealis and showing you how to reduce the weight of your camera bag without sacrificing your gear. Hmm, the mind boggles. Don't forget, you can now become a photography online supporter and help us make better content for you. Just click the join button or go to the relevant link down below. Until next time, take good care, but most of all, take good photos.